Well, everyone, thank you for joining today, and welcome to the last of our 2019 Small Farms Winter Webinars. Hosted by the University of Illinois Extension Local Food Systems and Small Farms Team. We appreciate you joining us for these webinars, and we will do our best to begin and end within the space of your lunch hour. This is a type tight time frame for our educators to deliver in-depth, actionable information. So please understand why we, do, why we are limiting our questions to the text box at the left during the presentation. I will do my best to make sure our presenter answers them as time allows. This presentation is being recorded and I will email Actually, Zach will email a link to the to the archive presentation as soon as possible after this concludes. There will also be a link for a short online evaluation of this presentation, and we would very much appreciate your feedback. This week's presentation is by Bronwyn Alley. She's a fellow local food system, small farms educator housed in Gallatin, Hamilton, Hardin, Pope, Saline, and White Counties. In her role as extension educator on her team, she identifies strategies for educating the public about issues in local food systems. Additionally, she works with small foods producers interested in specialty crops, including small fruit, vegetables, and tree fruit. Also, Bronwyn is responsible for the High Tunnel Program at Dixon Springs Agricultural Center. On today's webinar, Bronwyn will be sharing information on the fundamentals of producing high-quality, great-tasting tomatoes. Take it away, Bronwyn. All right. Thank you, Doug. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I hope everybody's had a, a good day, and hopefully we'll start your afternoon off. Uh, on a positive note. So as Doug said, I'm going to talk about the ABCs of tomato production. And in my role with the university, um, I have been an extension educator on the local food small farms team for about five years now. And prior to that, I conducted uh, research on fruits and vegetables at the Dixon Springs Agricultural Center, which is the southernmost outlying Ag Research Station for the University of Illinois. So I have I have probably been working with tomatoes and working with variety trials and other aspects of tomato production for um, we're getting close to 25 years now, which makes me sound makes me feel kind of old. But we'll we'll move forward with that. That's we don't want to dwell on that. Um, so anyway, we're going to talk about ABCs of tomato production and this figure on the first on the opening slide here. I found looking on. Uh, USDA publication on uh, grading criteria and inspections, and I just thought I'd throw it up here. Um, just a diagram of a tomato. We look at when we talk about the stem end, the calyx on the top. Um, some some things we might talk about later on when we talk about the shoulder of the tomato is is up around the calyx on the stem end. Uh, below you see the blossom end. Uh, we'll talk about things like blossom end rot. So just kind of familiarizing yourself in case you weren't sure on a tomato where some of these things are located. Uh, we also see inside the tomato in the locule, we have the uh, gel part along with the seeds inside the locules and then the, the fruit walls. So we will move forward. So kind of to, to kind of keep myself on track, just kind of give you an idea of categories we're going to talk about during this uh, presentation, uh, terminology and production method methods, variety selection, a uh, little bit on transplants, managing the plant structure, a uh, little bit on fertility, some common insect and disease problems, and some corks and other problems that we might see in tomato production. So when we talk about terminology and, and production methods. First thing we want to talk about is the two types of growth habits that tomatoes can can have. Uh, they, they are either determinate or indeterminate. On a determinate type tomatoes, they're, at some point their terminal growing point will turn into a flower cluster and, and the plant will, will no longer grow any further. Um, and we see those mainly with, with our F1 hybrids Whereas on an indeterminate plant, 
there is no flower cluster on a terminal growing point. It's 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 always it's always producing more vine, more stem. Um, an indeterminate plant can grow until uh, it frosts or freezes, and and a, something else kills it out. Um, it's 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 it will keep growing on its own. So, two basic differences in the growth habits on tomatoes. Uh, within determinate types of tomatoes, we see what we call a beefsteak or what I like to call like a, re a slicing tomato. Examples of some cultivars in that in that type of tomato uh, would be Florida 91, Celebrity, BH589. And then also plum type tomatoes. Uh, some of those cultivars might be uh, Plum Dandy, a San Marzano or Roma type. And then with indeterminate tomatoes, we also see beefsteak or slicing type. Uh, some cultivar examples of those would include Early Girl, Big Beef, uh, Big Boy, and, and Jet Star. Our, our grape or cherry type tomatoes, uh, cultivars on that might be a Juliet or a Sweet 100. We also have uh, heirloom, open pollinated or specialty type tomatoes. We see most of them in the indeterminate growth habit as well. Examples of those would be Cherokee Purple, uh, Green Zebra or Brandywine. And you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of different uh, cultivars of tomatoes uh, in both growth habit categories. So um, there are a lot of different varieties to select from. So when we talk about production methods, I kind of grouped it into two big categories. We have field grown, so outside field grown tomatoes, and then what we'll refer to as protected culture. So within field grown tomatoes, planting outside, um, the very, very basic um, minimal input production would be to just plant them out on bare ground. Uh, as we increase the amount of input into that type of production, we might come back and, and hill up and, and make some raised beds. But probably the most most common um, and one of the more productive production methods that we see in field grown tomatoes is using a plastic culture system where we're forming raised beds, covering that with a black plastic mulch and trickle or drip irrigation line is, is run underneath that plastic so that we can provide uh, fertilizer and water to the plant. Um, that plastic mulch helps as a weed barrier. It also helps to uh, maintain moisture within that bed. Um, so we, uh, within field grown tomatoes, um, generally our yields uh, are, are probably going to be a little bit higher on the plastic culture system. That's more of a commercially acceptable or conventional way that we, we grow field grown tomatoes. There's also some work with uh, no-till or reduced tillage production. In fact, one of my colleagues, Nathan Johanning, received a specialty crop block grant this past year to, he's actually going to be looking at uh, comparing tomato production in a in a traditional um, plastic culture system, bare ground system, and then also comparing it to a no-till or, or reduced tillage system. So be excited to see some of the results from his project. And if we think about um, a different production method uh, under what we call protected culture, we're looking at uh, protected culture looking at high tunnels, low tunnels, or a greenhouse uh, type situation with high tunnels. You know, those are basically a greenhouse structure that are, that is unheated. Um, low tunnels, um, we can kind of get some of the same benefits of a high tunnel with a lot less input. On a low tunnel, we're basically using uh, something to make a some type of of tubing or pipe to make a small structure over an individual row or bed out in the field, and we we'll stretch a little bit of plastic over that. Um, so we can gain some of the benefits with the low tunnels that we might see in a high tunnel without having to have quite as much input in that. But those aren't going to be a permanent structure like a high tunnel. And then with our greenhouse production, you know, um, true greenhouse production would have supplemental heat. And a lot of times we're using a hydroponic growing system in those. No matter whether you're growing in a field or in a protected culture system, irrigation is going to be essential. Um, if you want to realize maximum production potential and help maintain your high fruit quality. 
you know, sometimes we would like to hope that we can rely on Mother Nature to provide us the perfect amount of water. You know, we traditionally we say tomatoes need at least one inch of rain, one inch, one inch of water a week. Um, we can't rely on that consistency. So we need to be able to have some control over that in our production system. So uh, being able to use irrigation um, and drip irrigation is going to be, in my opinion, the most efficient way. Uh, it, you use a lot less water and you're able to deliver the water directly on top of the soil right next to the root system where the water and the nutrients can be absorbed. Also with the irrigation or drip irrigation, you can apply fertilizer through the irrigation line. Um, so it makes it really easy. And, and we can also be doing other things in the field while we're irrigating. So the next couple of slides show some, show some examples of this. So the picture on the left would be an example of field grown tomatoes grown, just grown on bare soil, no plastic, no irrigation. And you can see um, we have we have a couple of different varieties on this in this particular field. But if you notice the um, we're having some weed control issues here um, with, with no mulching, um, we are going to have to be a lot more diligent on mechanical weed control or even chemical control um, without the. Uh, Without the addition of irrigation, you know, we, we could be hindering or having a, a negative impact on our, our fruit quality and our yield in this situation. And then you look on the photo on the right. This is an example of a plastic culture system. Uh, in this system, they did not pull a raised bed. So the black plastic and the trickle are just pulled on it, their flat beds. But you can see that they are definitely affording a lot better weed control. Um, and we are going to be able to provide supplemental water directly to those plants. And then in these pictures, uh, these, these two pictures are both taken from uh, the two high tunnels at the Dixon Springs Ag Center from what we grew last year. So the picture on the left shows um, the, uh, the bed, the four bed closest to us are determinate tomatoes. And those are grown in, in this particular tunnel in, ra in raised beds, permanent raised beds. We actually put two drip lines through there, but we did not put black plastic on the top of the beds. Uh, we don't feel that we need the addition of the black plastic in, in this high tunnel situation. And on the picture on the left, on the right, uh, is tomatoes that we grew in the other tunnel that are a hydroponic system. And in that system, they are these would be an, in, an indeterminate type tomato that is pruned to a single vine and they are trained up a, a single string that's, that's hung from, um, stretch it up to the, to the rafter. We can run a single string down and clip the actual tomato vine to that string and uh, continue to train it up that direction. So the, just some to give you some examples of some different production methods that we can utilize for tomatoes here in, in Illinois. So now I want to talk a little bit about variety selection. Uh, I really feel like it's important to match the varieties to fit your business plan. Whether you are wholesale, thinking about growing for a wholesale market or the fresh market, whether you are a certified organic grower or, or utilizing best management practices or more conventional type production system? Are you marketing to restaurants? Are you selling at a farmer's market? Do you have CSAs? Uh, you're opening up your patch to you pick or you're selling, you know, from a farm stand at, at your farm or someone else's farm. Um, also, uh, something else to think about is the production method that you're using in your business plan. Are you growing field grown tomatoes, high tunnel tomatoes? Are they more of a greenhouse tomato in a hydroponic system? You know, there are so many different varieties out there and we need to select ones that fit our business model as well as thinking about our customer preference. Um, and obviously flavor is always a big proponent. Um, this is, you know, we, we really like to see good flavor in our tomatoes so we can see happy faces and returning customers. Um, but we also want varieties that are going to provide, uh, 
the yields that we that we're going to need to see in our different production systems. Uh, also, in variety selection, we're going to look for disease resistance or tolerant varieties. That's you know when we talk about an IPM program, an integrated pest management program, one of the things that we can do to help um, reduce the amount of of pesticide applications that we might need to make, especially for disease issues, would be to find varieties that that have a disease resistance or a tolerance to certain diseases that we're trying to control. Um, so that, that goes plays into our IPM planner program. Another brief source to look at um, would be annual variety trial reports or updates from various Midwestern locations that might be in your same hardiness zone. Uh, Purdue hosts, uh, on one of Purdue's websites, they, they put out every year the Midwest Vegetable Variety Trial Report bulletins. And I've included uh, that in the last pages on, our, for, on your resources links so that you, could, you can see that web address to go to. Um, varieties that perform well in Southern Illinois in my location very well may not do as well in Northern Illinois. So those in Southern Illinois might look at variety trials conducted in, in Kentucky or Southeast, Southwestern Indiana or maybe even Missouri. Whereas those up in the Northern part of Illinois may look to trials done in, in Iowa or uh, Northern Indiana or Michigan or Wisconsin. So Try to try to find variety reports that are closer to your same hardiness zone and see how those how varieties are, are performing in your your locations. Um, we also suggest that everybody try, you know, try two or three new varieties on your farm each year. But just remember to put out a few plants, you know, 10, 15, 20, maybe don't don't put out an acre of a brand new variety that you've never looked at on your farm. Uh, we know that. You know, varieties can perform a little bit differently even in microclimates between, uh, they might look different in farms that are only 20 or 30 miles apart. So it's really a good idea to narrow your use of variety trial reports to narrow down and decide which varieties you would might, might like to take a look at and then try some of those on your farm in a small amount. So through the next couple of slides, um, in our high tunnel last year, in our the tunnel with the raised beds, in ground beds, um, we did a small, we only had four varieties that we looked at and we did an observational trial. So, so we did not replicate our plots. We just had um, a run of 12 plants of each variety that we collected data off of. And so I just wanna, using these next two slides as an example of uh, in the importance of variety selection. So Florida 91, this variety has been around for 20 or more years. Um, from our observation trials, we averaged just a little over 16 pounds of number one fruit per plant. They averaged about 10 and a half ounces. You know, this is a, a good standard red slicing tomato, beefsteak type tomato. Uh, and again, the 16 pounds is on number one grade. So they were above eight ounces, no blemishes, no imperfections, uniform size. Total marketable yield for this was approximately 24 pounds per plant. Um, so with the spacing and the room in our high tunnel, if you look at the bottom for rec a rough calculation, if we yielded 16 pounds of plant of number one quality fruit, and I could put approximately 300 plants in my tunnel, and if I could sell my tomatoes for two dollars a pound, I could, I, I would see an uh, a, uh, anticipated gross yield of or gross sales of about ninety six hundred dollars. If we look at a second variety, Camaro, which this variety had I had had not seen in trial before, um, but again, it's very similar to Florida ninety one. It's a determinant. It's a beef steak, red slicing tomato. Size-wise, it's just a little bit bigger, um, 11 ounces on average, but it did yield almost four pounds per plant of number ones more than Florida 91. 
and I believe its total marketable yield was uh, right at 30 pounds per plant. And so if we run the numbers on this at 20 pounds per plant times 300 pounds or 300 plants at $2 a pound, that's giving us an anticipated gross sales of about $12,000. So variety selection alone can have a, uh, a significant dollar advantage uh, given your situation. Um, if all things were equal and the, and the flavor profiles were were very similar on these two varieties, you know, from a business standpoint, I would probably be looking at planting more Camaro um, just so that I, it, it yields more. Um, one of the other things that I noticed, this is just anecdotally about these two varieties, if we look at Florida 91 again, it's hard to tell from this picture, but there is a lot of foliage on Florida 91 compared to Camaro. Camaro still had plenty of foliage to cover, uh, to, to hold the fruit load, but um, not nearly the, the overabundance of vegetative growth um, that we see on Florida 91, which is actually something that we would, we, we prefer. Uh, we want to have enough foliage to, to uh, carry our crop load, but we don't want to have excessive vegetative growth. So if we talk about transplants and just, just briefly talking about transplants, if you're growing your own transplants out, you want to make sure that you're allowing at least six to seven weeks to grow a good transplant. You know, and ideally we'd like these to kind of look square. We don't want them to be much taller than they are wide. Uh, and we've research has shown that larger transplants um, produce earlier yields. And depending on your system, your production system, um, you might not be able to grow. You, you might not have room to to grow transplants out in a in a four inch pot. Um, but maybe you could go with a two and a half inch size transplant. Um, when we get the really small transplant sizes, they it's they tend to get leggy and stretchy on us um, just because we don't have the ability to spread them out. And when you look on this picture, uh, these transplants are grown out in four inch clay pots. Uh, if, if, if you'll notice in these trays, we're skipping every other hole, we're spreading these out. If we didn't have the room or the space to do that, even though these are in a larger transplant container, uh, they would still stretch as well. So we need to make sure that we are uh, maintaining proper plant spacing when we're growing out our transplants. We also want to try to grow a drier transplant, so we're only watering when needed. Uh, we tend to have a healthier, stronger transplant when we can grow them a little bit drier. Um, probably after we start to see our, our, oh, our first to second tree leaf, um, on our transplants, then we can think about applying um, some fertilizer, and usually we look at, at like triple twenty. That's greenhouse grade, um, just to good, just to give them a little bit of a little bit of fertilizer to keep them moving along um, while we're growing them out. Uh, we want to make sure that we're maintaining good light so that we don't see stretching. Also, another thing to think about would be the proper temperature for tomatoes. Daytime temperatures, you know, we're looking at. 70, 75 degrees, um, and not, not much hotter than that. And then nighttime temperatures, you know, we're looking at 60, maybe 55, but I definitely don't want to go lower than 55. Um, and that is just to help maintain good, uh, good growth, um, and not, and not slow them down because we want to, we want to try to grow these transplants out in that six week period. So managing plant structure. So on this, we're going to talk about we'll talk a little bit about pruning, and then also the support system that we're going to have for our different production systems. So with pruning, we talk about uh, suckering, um, and we see we we see this with determinants. Um, we we prune in either a field or high tunnel situations. Another type of pruning is leaf pruning. Uh, leaf pruning is done on indeterminates. Uh, also, uh, 
on these indeterminates, we will also be have also be doing sucker pruning as well. And we see this a lot in, in a high tunnel or greenhouse production. Um, that's not to say that we couldn't do leaf pruning on determinants out in the field as well, but most of the time that's not, we, we don't need to do that. Uh, we can just, we can get by with just the sucker pruning. And then another, another type of pruning that is done sometimes is what's called cluster thinning. And we see this a lot on indeterminates in the greenhouse where we want, we're looking f to maintain a certain uh, uniform size and quality on the fruit. So we might thin out, you know, let's say on a certain variety that we set uh, four or five fruit in each flower cluster. We might prune that back to just three fruit so that they size up to the, to the size that, that we, we want and have more uniform growth. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about these in the ne next couple of pictures. Uh, when we talk about support systems, how are we going to hold these plants up out in, in our production system? So you know, we could talk about cages. Uh, one of the downfalls of cages is they take up a lot of room when we're storing them um, in the fall, fall and winter when we're not, not using them. They are relatively easy to set up. Um, you know, just, we're going to be setting those over the plants. Um, but once we get that cage in place, it becomes harder to prune and harvest. Um, might even be a little bit more difficult to spray and, and things because um, just on the, uh, how those are set up in the field. Another system, support system would be to provide individual stakes. Uh, we've seen this done some with uh, maybe heirlooms uh, or indeterminates that are grown out in the field situation where we're driving an individual T-post at each stake or at, at each plant and, and tying those. Um, that can be pretty time consuming. Uh, it's also um, kind of labor intensive to be driving a T-post at every plant, uh, especially if you have a, a relatively large planting. Probably the most... Um, the most common support system, um, one that we see a lot in our commercial production, is the trellis or Florida weave system. We have very little storage. Uh, we're looking at uh, a few T-posts and, and wooden tomato stakes that we have to store somewhere. This does require multiple trips through the field as we're, we're putting new strings on every so many inches up as the plant grows. But it does allow for easier pruning and harvest. The plants are really open uh, to work on them at that point. And then finally, we can, another system, last system we have would be the vertical or the single string trellis system. Again, this is, this is time consuming. Um, we would use that in, in the um, um, picture that I showed you, like in the hydroponic tunnel where we're training an indeterminate to one or two stems and we're dropping down a string and clipping the vine directly to the stem, to the uh, string. Uh, this does allow for quick pruning and harvesting. And definitely, uh, if we're going to be needing to spray, make any spray applications, we definitely have uh, good canopy penetration with this system. So if we look at sucker pruning, um, the diagram on the left uh, shows you we look at, we find our very first flower cluster, so the bottom most flower cluster, and then right below that, we will see a sucker that will be found between the stem and the leaf petiole. We want to leave that sucker in place, and then as we work our way down the stem, any other suckers that we see in any of those, uh, any of those angles between the stem and the leaf petioles, we're going to remove those suckers. The picture on the on the right just shows you an actual an actual photo of the tomato plant. You see <clears throat> the flower cluster forming on the top there, and right below it, you see a sucker that's coming up. Uh, we would leave that sucker. Um, we would prune out anything below that. When we prune, when we leave the one sucker right below the flower cluster, and we prune all of the others out, we would consider that a heavy pruning or heavy, heavy suckering. If we were to leave two suckers below the bottom flower cluster and remove everything else, then that would be moderate. Um, we leave three suckers, that would be light. Um, and if we maybe just take the very 
two bottom little suckers that come out from the base of the plant, you know, that's pretty much not, not doing any suckering. So, um, we have some varieties are more vigorous and might need to have heavier pruning versus moderate or light pruning. On the leaf pruning, um, and this is really common for indeterminates that you can prune those back to either one or two stems. And basically in, in this, uh, we're removing the leaves and suckers, anything below the lowest flower cluster is removed. So if you look at the picture, you see we just have bare stems um, from anything below those flower, the, the lowest fruit cluster. We're, we're leaving we're leaving leaves above the fruit clusters. We we will at this point we're probably pinching out suckers. We, we're not looking for sucker production. We just want to see the the fruit production off of this single vine that we're training. You know this is going to definitely improve air circulation, which in turn helps reduce disease incidence. It also hastens fruit development. Definitely makes it makes management a lot easier. Um, I think in this picture, too, you might get a, a little bit better sense, too. It's hard to see the, the strings coming down from the, from the rafter, but if you notice on the stems, you see those, those kind of white plastic clips, and you see the white string beside the stem, and we're, we're actually clipping the stem to that string, and the string um, is holding that in place. So you want to make sure that you've got a good trussing system in your, uh, in your high tunnel that can hold the the weight on the the uh, fruit load from the from your planting. So now we're going to try to show a video here. Just I'm not going to show the whole thing, but we're going to show a video on actually doing the trellis weave system. And so if you if you notice, I think it's going to play while we're talking. So. Our plant spacing, which we haven't talked about that, but plant spacing um, in in the high tunnel on determinants, we're, we're, we're spacing our plants two feet apart. Um, and so every two plants, between every two second plant, you see we have a wooden stake planted or driven. Um, and also um, we use this system in the field as well as in a high tunnel. Um, and if you're out in a field situation, I would highly recommend that we drive a T-post um, every, every 30 feet or so um, because if the fruit load on some of your plants gets too great, uh, these wooden stakes can snap over. And so you don't want to lose a 200-foot row of tomatoes. Um, if we can have T-posts uh, scattered through the field, then we can kind of have some stoppage if, if we see some breakage but so basically what she's doing is we're making our first string um, she's about I don't know eight or ten inches off the ground and you see she's going on the same side of the the tomatoes then she goes around the post you want to make sure you hook that string firmly under itself and keep moving along we're basically creating a string cage um, and as these plants grow, we will add more strings. Um, most of the time, you uh, on determinants, you're going to put probably end up having about four strings, um, and they're usually approximately eight inches apart. If you have fruit on the tomatoes plants themselves already, you want to make sure that you hook that that string and get it below that that bottom fruit cluster to help hold and provide it support. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears and talk about fertility a little bit. So on a general fertility program, first and foremost, we are always going to start with a soil test. We, we need to be able to make annual amendments, and we need to have something to base it on. So we have to do a soil test every year. Um, get our soil test results back. We're going to apply approximately half of the nitrogen and potassium and all of the phosphorus that is recommended, we're going to apply those pre-plant. Um, also on our soil test, we want to make sure that we're looking at our pH because that can be that can have an effect on 
our nutrient uptake. You know, and ideally our pH is between six and six eight. Uh, at the time that we're transplanting in the field, the high tunnel, wherever, we, we want to apply a starter fertilizer as well. And that is something that starter fertilizers are high in phosphorus relative to the nitrogen. So in, on the slide, you see the example starter fertilizer might uh, have a formulation of, of 1248.8. And so you can see that um, compared to nitrogen, it's a starter fertilizer is really high in uh, phosphorus. We are also, because we are applied, we only put half of our nitrogen in and potassium in pre-plant, we're going to then make weekly fertilizer applications of the additional nitrogen, uh, potassium, also some calcium and magnesium. And, you know, we're going to be using products like potassium nitrate, calcium nitrate. Um, research has shown that nitrate forms um, perform better in our, in our growing system. And something else that we we probably all need to be doing a better job of, myself included, is taking tissue tests. And it's recommended that we do at least, we take these at least three times during the season to help optimize our fertility management. Look at, get our results back and we can see the uh, ratios of our potassium, calcium, magnesium, nitrogen, and see where we might need to be making additional um, applications or maybe a reduction in something. And as far as fertility, again, optimum pH range for tomatoes between six and six eight. Uh, organic matter, we would really like it to see it see it at two and a half percent or higher. Um, nitrogen requirements um, on an acre of tomatoes, variety dependent. Um, we're going to need anywhere between ninety to one hundred and twenty pounds of nitrogen per acre. And again, we're going to put about a third to a half of that applied pre-plant, uh, broadcast over our beds. And then we're going to apply about a pound of nitrogen per acre per day through the drip line. And after about three weeks or so, we're going to bump that amount up a little bit. We're going to bump it up to about a pound and a half to two pounds of nitrogen per acre a day. Or if you're not using a drip system, or you're not set up to fertilize through the drip, your irrigation system. Um, the other option would be to side dress with 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre, four weeks, and then again, eight weeks after transplanting uh, in your field situation. As far as phosphorus requirements, um, I have a pretty big range on here, zero to 240 pounds of uh, you know, a phosphate per acre and that's applied pre-plant. And this range is pretty wide because it's going to be based on our soil tests and our soil type. Uh, uh, a lighter soil won't have the holding capacity that a heavier soil will. And so we might, uh, based on our soil tests, we might need to be applying uh, more phosphorus um, to meet the, 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 the crop load required for the season. And the same thing with potassium. Um, you know, we're looking at zero to 300 pounds of potassium per acre. And again, this is a third to a half of it can be applied pre-plant. And then we're going to make a pound and a half to two, two and a half pounds per acre per day through the, through the drip line. Um, on the fertility, you know, one of our main goals with the nitrogen is that we can provide the plant with enough nitrogen for efficient use, but not promoting unwanted vegetative growth. We, want, we don't want to starve the plant to death. We want it to be able to carry the, the fruit load, but we don't want it to be putting all of its, having excess nitrogen that it's putting into vegetative growth. Um, tomatoes definitely have a very high potassium requirement, and this is key uh, when we think about the development of the flavor profile and also for uh, proper fruit coloring. Uh, one of the problems that we can see with tomatoes sometimes is, is a what's called yellow shoulder disorder. We'll see some pictures of that uh, later in the presentation. Calcium is also needed in tomatoes. Uh, it helps to decrease our incidence of blossom end rot and helps to maintain our fruit firmness. 
basically calcium helps to uh, maintain cell wall structures. And so, you know, this is where, um, you know, being, being diligent on your soil test, um, getting it red, putting, putting in the right amount of nutrients based on your soil tests is important and, and also conducting those tissue tests so that you can see where, how your up nutrient uptake is going. Um, I also want to mention in here again, um, the need, the, the importance of, of irrigation, uh, especially when we think about the movement of calcium and potassium through the plant. Uh, if we can help maintain an adequate moisture level in our planting, this is really going to benefit the plant's ability to, to uptake nutrients. If we see um, a significant uh, rain, rain event and then, it, and then the, the soil dries down quickly or dries down and then again we see another bump in a lot of, a lot of rain, um, this inconsistency in the moisture change it, it signals the plant and its uptake is of the nutrients is is not efficient and so we start to see blossom and rot problems and potentially a little shoulder issue so being able to irrigate uh, or mulch in some way or a combination of both to help maintain adequate and proper moisture is is very beneficial in tomato production so in these pictures, I um, wanted to put these two pictures in here just to kind of show the difference in varieties and their, their um, nitrogen requirements. Um, so again, these are two different varieties that were in our high tunnel uh, last season. They received the same uh, fertility program. And you see the picture on the top has a lot more vegetative growth. Um, as compared to the picture on the bottom. I wouldn't say that the picture on the top is, is overly excessive in vegetative growth, but you can definitely see a, a variety difference between these two. Um, in the, the photo on the bottom, uh, there's definitely a lot more, a lot more uh, production, plant production has gone into fruit production as opposed to the vegetative production. So just just note that different varieties have different different um, nitrogen rate uh, levels. Some of them would require higher rates of nitrogen than others uh, to produce the crop, but you know we can see these differences when we have varieties or cultivars side by side um, under the same nutrient uh, management program. So now we'll talk a little bit about some common insect and disease problems. Some of the more common insects that we can see in tomatoes would be the tomato hornworm, tomato fruit worm, uh, stink bugs. We, definitely aphids are also a problem. Um, sometimes we can have some other, we might have, uh, might, might have cutworms or army worms fly in. Um, but those are probably the three main insect issues that we're going to deal with every year. Um, and then as far as diseases, probably early blight. Uh, we're, we see that a lot and we're starting to, we start to see a lot of uh, different bacterial diseases. Um, we're seeing bacterial disease incidents uh, on the rise, I think. Um, also in diseases, you know, we think about verticillium, wilt, and fusarium, but a lot of our varieties now have resistance to those. And so where those those diseases don't seem to be as big of a problem for us um, because we have varieties that have resistance to them. Uh, we're just going to talk about these problems, but as far as control recommend, recommendations, that can be found in the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for commercial growers, and in the resources pages on the on the tail end of the presentation, you'll see a link to that. So tomato hornworm. Uh, so this, I think we've all seen the tomato hornworm. Um, this is the picture on the top right, some of the fruit damage that we see. Most of the time we're going to see our plants defoliating before we see a major damage in the, in the fruit, but um, they, they do need to be controlled. They only have one, one 
generation in a in a season, um, and they actually, once we scout and know that they're out there, they are relatively easy to control. The tomato fruit worm, which is also a uh, corn earworm, same insect, just attacking two different crops, and we we call it a corn earworm when it's in sweet corn. We call it tomato fruit worm when it's on tomatoes. Uh, you can see. Uh, Definitely a different feeding pattern than the tomato worm. Uh, bores down into the core, uh, makes a pretty pretty yucky mess on the fruit. And then also stink bugs. Uh, sometimes we might see, if we're not familiar with what stink bug damage looks like on uh, the fruit, this could be uh, confused with a potential disease or or uh, virus issue. But when we see this this yellow corking or pithing in the fruit that's that's caused from stink bug feeding uh, on the fruit. So just a picture of early blight. Uh, you know, this is the that disease that we see. It'll start on the very bottom leaves and work its way up through the plant. Uh, you can see as the plant's starting to, the leaves are dying off and defoliating. You know, we start to see fruit trying to ripen and and progress forward in the reproductive cycle of the plant. Um, but at this stage in the game, uh, there's not a lot to save when your plants get to this point. So we want to make sure you're looking in your spray guide and see what you can be doing to be preventative and uh, proactive for early blight. Then also, um, three different bacterial diseases. We have bacterial canker on the left, bacterial speck in the middle. And that's, I think the word spot has been cut off, but that third one is bacterial spot. So if you notice on, on canker, the, uh, the symptoms are raised. The, the uh, injury on the fruit is actually raised up, whereas on bacterial speck and spot, those, uh, the markings on the fruit are actually indentions. And obviously, bacterial speck, they're a lot smaller than the... Uh, infection sites on the bacterial spot. So um, just so you can see a difference in, in these, but all three of these are bacterial diseases, uh, three separate bacterial diseases, um, and they do present a little bit differently on the fruit. So some quirks or other problems that we might see um, that can be caused from nutrient deficiencies, uh, fluctuations in, in moisture, uh, there can be unfavorable conditions during pollination. Maybe it's too wet or it's too hot that can cause issues. Could just be genetics. Uh, certain varieties are more prone than others to certain problems. Um, and sometimes it, we might see something that's caused just from our own human error. So the yellow shoulder disorder, this would be a picture of that, of what that looks like. We talked about that uh, earlier in the fertility slides. Um, this is not an issue with the fruit not ripening. If you look at that, that picture of the fruit on the top right with the yellowing around the shoulders, that tissue is never going to ripen because there is a, there's a deficiency in potassium and some environmental, environmental uh, conditions can also play into this disorder. It's actually one that's researched quite a bit because they're, they still... Um, Researchers are still not 100% sure why this disorder occurs, um, but they do know that potassium plays a role in it, and they also feel like there's some environmental factors as well. Um, sometimes the disorder doesn't present as prominently as, as it looks in the top right picture. Um, the bottom picture is another example of yellow shoulder. It's not necessarily on the shoulder itself, but it's it still has the same issues. And you look at the... the um, picture of the tomato that's been cut, you know, we see the, the, the yellowing in that, the tissue of the wall itself. And so, um, you know, these tomatoes would have to be, would have to be cold because they're never going to be ripe. Um, as far as if you were shipping those, uh, or if those were in, selling into a wholesale market, um, you may be able to sell those as canners, um, you know, most of us, if we were growing these at home and this was happening, we might just cut that top portion out and hopefully the tissue uh, on the bottom half of the tomato would would uh, have ripened enough and not have the yellow discoloration that we could go ahead and utilize it in some fashion. 
Another disorder that we see sometimes would be green shoulder. And I think on this one, that tends to be more of, of a riot of a variety or a cultivar issue. Um, like the yellow shoulder, uh, if you see, look at the picture on the left, um, that greenness is never, is never going to ripen out. That's not, that's not going to turn, turn red eventually. Um, those shoulders are going to stay that green color and the tissue underneath will stay, uh, unripened or, or, um, it, it won't ripen out to red and be usable. So this green shoulder, I, I feel like, um, we're seeing less and less of that because I, I believe that's something that tomato breeders um, are working to, to minimize in uh, new cultivars that they bring on. Uh, blossom and rot. This is very common. You probably have all seen this. Um, again, this is actually caused from a calcium deficiency. Uh, as we, as the plants water and nutrient uptake system is, um, becomes inconsistent. We don't have calcium reaching the uh, all of the uh, fruit tissue down at the blossom end. And if you see the, if you look at the picture on the top, the top left is the early stages. And so we see a, a, a white discoloration on the blossom end where the, the cell walls are not uh, staying firm because there's not enough calcium in there. And um, as that tomato continues to ripen, those that particular tissue in the bottom end does not have enough calcium to maintain integrity, and so it starts to rot in on itself. Um, so while this looks like a disease, and maybe even the picture on the right, um, we might have a secondary um, infection or disease coming in on that um, the, the, the cause of this is not a disease itself. It is, it's a uh, calcium deficiency and uh, by having a more consistent uh, uh, moisture availability to the plant, we can help reduce this. Sometimes we do see a little bit of, of uh, some, some cultivars can be more susceptible to this than others as well. And then cracking, a lot of this, a lot of this can be cultivar, um, and a lot of this is environmental. On the top left, that would be what we would call a concentric cracking. Uh, on the top right, you know, those are just deep, deep cracks from the from the stem. Um, and the picture in the middle was actually taken. You know, um, we our fruit was looking good. We were we were starting to ripen, and then we received. Uh, three or four inch rain in a very short amount of time that plant took up so much water that the tissue the cells couldn't keep up with expanding uh, on the fruit and the the skin is actually cracking or tearing because the, the fruit is swelling up from the intake of, of water and so again cracking can help can be um, minimized by having adequate uh, or a more monitored, um, even watering system. Uh, zippering, now this can occur, uh, this occurs during pollination and we're basically seeing a, uh, a section of the pollen tube that, that didn't receive pollen. And so um, it's it's very minimal problem, but if you, if you see this and you're wondering why it's happening, this actually was a situation that occurred at the time of pollination. And then there's cat facing. And again, this is an issue, issues that come up during pollination, if it's too hot or it's too wet. And, and we see different scarring and different things as compared to this cat face. Give everybody a moment to take that in. Go for it. Um, and then the other thing we look at is what, what we call weather checking. And we see this a lot. Um, if we have several several mornings several days in a row where we have a lot of heavy dew that sits on that fruit and doesn't dry off until long up into the morning um that the that moisture that water staying on the skin of the fruit can actually cause um this thinning and the and these the this the problems in this fruit um and so this is what we would refer to as weather checking and then on this one, uh, pretty common. Everybody 
we see this, especially after we have, have done some sucker pruning. Um, this is what we call physiological leaf roll. There's really nothing wrong with this plant at all. This is just something that, that the plants do. And again, we see this more when we're doing sucker pruning, so probably more on some on determinate plants. Um, if we're not doing, I, I think we do send, tend to see it more on determinants and, and again after suckering, but there, there's nothing wrong with this plant. And I threw this picture in there just because sometimes herbicide injury can can look a lot like disease. And this is actually a picture of glyphosate injury. Um, and you can see it, it uh, we see a lot of yellowing down in the new growth points. And on, as far as weed management recommendations, again, those can be found in your Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for commercial growers. Things that might hasten ripening, uh, warmer temperatures, um, well, you know, but not, we don't want them to be too warm. Um, and when we have plants, uh, if we, we have planted tomatoes um, for a fall crop, a lot of times as the, as those fall temperatures start to drop, uh, our um, third and fourth cluster of tomatoes, they may never ripen. They may just stay and hold green because uh, the temperatures are, are so cool, They're, the process is just not moving along. Also, if we cause stress to plants, we can hasten ripening. So we talk about shoot pruning, uh, the sucker pruning. Um, one of the reasons why we sucker prune is to uh, see to to uh, speed up the ripening process on that first cluster of tomatoes. Um, if we if root pruning happens to be done, we can that also causes stress um, by root pruning. If we're running our tiller through and we happen to get too close to the plants, we might prune off, you know, inadvertently do some root pruning. Um, then we might see fruit on that particular plant start to ripen quicker. Also, if we stress the plant out with a uh, uh, reduction in irrigation, a lack of water, we can start to see ripening coming on quicker. But we, we want to make sure that we avoid excessive nitrogen fertilizer. Um, because again, this is just telling the plant to the, continue to grow vegetatively. So it's putting its energy into that instead of the process of, of uh, ripening out the fruit. Um, let's do this in there again from the USDA. It shows different, different stages of um, color require color classifications on tomatoes and their different stages of harvesting so anywhere from green to red and then this page and the next page are uh, resources that are put together for you uh, to utilize there's uh, a to commercial tomato handbook from georgia um, one from the tomato production book uh, guide out of uh, penn state um, there's the link to the midwest vegetable variety trial report also, the uh, University of Kentucky Center for Crop Diversification, they have a lot of good crop profiles. So for tomatoes, they actually have several on there, uh, one for field-grown tomatoes, one for growing in a high tunnel. Um, they also have several um, tomato budget sheets that you can look at, and they have them for both small-scale and large-scale. Um, so I definitely recommend that. Um, if you have questions on grading or standards, uh, the USDA AMS page is a, a good place to look. Uh, on the bottom of this page, your link to the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for Commercial Growers. Uh, I recommend that everybody get this book every year. I have one in my car. I have one in every desk. Um, I, as, as an educator, I'm constantly pulling that out to help in, help growers answer questions. I mean, this is our this is our guide, our go-to, and so we we all need to utilize it as best we can. Uh, also, I found uh, on Cornell they had some best management strategies in high tunnels, uh, looking at optimal spacing. Um, not I am not um, showing any company preference. I just found a couple of companies that offer. Uh, soil testing and tissue testing for tomatoes, and those would be Spectrum Analytical and Waters Agricultural Laboratories. Again, I'm not promoting either of these companies, just in, in looking at some searches and um, trying to find a couple of, of places 
relatively close to the Midwest that provide these services. These were two that I came across. This is not, uh, you know, I, there are definitely other companies out there and, and would recommend trying, trying any of those. If, if you can try to do a soil a tissue test at all, I'm you know, definitely recommending doing that. Um, also, the Illinois Specialty Growers Association page. And if you're not a member of the Illinois Specialty Growers Association or the Illinois Vegetable Growers Association, I'd like to definitely uh, recommend that you look into joining uh, one or both of those groups. And um, they're, they're, it's a good organization, good associations to join, um, providing you a lot of different information um, as you look into getting started or continuing to grow, uh, especially crops here in Illinois. Then also I'll put in the plug for the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter. This comes out um, 20 issues a year. I'll try to give uh, timely and relevant information and updates on fruit and vegetable crops in Illinois. And with that, I think I have no time left for questions, apparently. It's 101, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, Zach has done a very good job answering, and there was only one that I could see that didn't get answered, and that was a question about how far apart are the wooden stakes when you're doing the Florida weave. So the wooden stakes, are our plants are spaced two feet apart. Um, if you're in a field situation, you may go two and a half feet, but your stakes are, you put a wooden stake um between after every second plant. So you have two plants, a stake, two plants, a stake. Okay. They're just, they're just halfway between those plants. Okay. And, and a T-post every 30 feet. Uh, yeah, approximately. Um, you know, just wherever in that, you know, 30-foot range, instead of putting a wooden, uh, the wooden post in that you normally would, I would drive a T-post in. Okay. And you're definitely starting those rows with T posts, and you may even need to be anchoring the, those T posts, you know, uh, back away from the the uh, the rows just a little bit because you're going to end up having a lot of weight um, as that se as the season progresses and you have fruit load on that in that system. So you want to make sure your in posts aren't pulling out. Great. Well, with that, I'd like to thank our presenter, Bronwyn Alley, one of our local food system small farms educators for the fabulous presentation, sharing her expertise. Lots of good information there. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for this, our final webinar of the season. Uh, I hope you got some valuable information that you can help use in your small farm endeavors and hopefully something you can put in place yet this year. Please look for an email from us with a link to the archived webinar on the Illinois Local Foods YouTube channel, as well as a very short evaluation of the webinar you have just watched. We do look at your feedback and use it to change shape our future webinars. We really do. With that, I wish you a fabulous rest of the day and a productive growing season in 2019. Thanks again.